Hello and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Byer. And I'm in Chautauqua now, so you will see random people walking past the window. <laughs> <laughs> and I am in New Jersey. Happy Pride. This is This and That. We are going to be discussing everything going on in the figure skating world this week. So if you are new here, please subscribe below and smash that like button. Oh, Jonathan, I actually got a gift in the mail. It was a shirt. Sure. Wait, I need to get it. Yeah. Hold on, pause. I've never really had like a bona fide pride shirt before, but I do now. That is definitely a pride shirt, yeah. Signed by Oksana Bayul, okay? Shut up. She saw it, thought of me, you know, in case you didn't know. It's here, we're queer, <laughs> let's discuss the Good figure. sleep shirt, good sleep shirt. It's it looks like my it. stretching sleep shirt, absolutely. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thank uh, you, Oksana. Always an ally. Yes. Um, I don't know that people realize, but like she is up on things in skating and this war in Ukraine. She, I, I told her, I tried to explain that she should have just her own channel, just with her passion, like just discussing what's going on in the war every day. She is really... And passion speaker. I mean, that was my big takeaway, actually, from your interview with her recently about all of those events, is just the amount of passion she has about all of this. She feels well, big. It's nice to have a Ukrainian speak dial where you can be like, where's Bakhmut? What is yeah, this? Please book? explain. Yeah, exactly. Please explain where is everything. I still don't get why they call... It's Ukraine versus the Ukraine. And then, it would, and I know that the Ukraine, you're not supposed to say, but people say it, then people get very offended. And how did that come about? You know, we need a long history lesson on that, but that would be a great YouTube. Even, video. I mean, it wasn't really until this conflict that many people stopped calling it Kiev and start, started calling it Kiev. Yeah. All yeah. the liberals on TV call it Kiev. When you talk to a Ukrainian who speaks Russian, they still call it Kiev. It is insane. Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and all the dialects and everything. I just remember as a kid, they would do like school lunches with something called Chicken Kiev. Do you remember that? That's was, offensive. But yeah. I am really happy with the food. <laughs> you know, I just always remember the fluff piece that said that Oksana was from Nyiprovsk, and now it's Nipro, which is much easier to say. So thank goodness for everyone. We don't have time. Yeah, just... <laughs> <laughs> always was then she training in Odessa is that where the Odessa part, part came yes. in yeah okay. Galina was in Odessa okay yeah. so yeah. um also I go to get a um I've gone to like this Russian spa I've gotten massages there and there is they had like these two Ukrainian flags and then like they moved them back because you know it's all kinds of former Soviets descending and like I realized on Monday the flags were there but I had a uh, you know a massage appointment on Saturday and the flags were um you know conspicuously they're like so and so is coming let's tuck them a little further yes yeah. Yeah. yeah oh dear yeah so mm -hmm. complicated so complicated all of it but such an outspoken people why we love you know <laughs> lots of opinions yes yeah yeah, there is there is very rarely a question as to where they stand on an, on, on a, on a subject. <laughs> I just said that there's this big dude, Vova, who, um, so I finally asked Vova yesterday, I said, well, where is your, like, where are you from? Because the, the name Vladimir could be, and he's like, no, I am Georgian. And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, like, you just, yeah, you thought, spicy, right? Yeah, Remember they, yeah. told us that they asked <laughs> Terry what cocktail she would be? She's like, well, I'm Georgian, so it would be spicy. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's right. Me, I am doctor. My hands, this is MRI. And I thought, oh, <laughs> all right. You okay. know, we are moving it along. Well, Jonathan, this was a really interesting week in skating. You know, figure skating and the Today Show collided in such an interesting way this week when Hoda Kotb asked the figure skaters, uh, Alexa Kinnear and Brandon Fraser and Vincent Joe, that it has been 500 days without their medals. And I thought that all of this was like really fascinating because this is a story that really was allowed to drop in the immediacy after and the it did. I was surprised by that because it seemed like a story that would have really taken off. And I feel outside of the skating circles, it 
it kind of is unknown. People remember because NBC was pushing the Valieva love during that team event. So everyone started texting me from the, we'll say general public, civilians were, were contacting me being like, wow, that Valieva is really amazing. So then they do remember when it was discovered she doped, but I don't, I don't think anyone is really as aware of the fact that it had ramifications into the medal ceremony. And this, when people ask, you know, they've said for over a year, and this actual <clears throat> event really sullied the taste for figure skating and the like in the mouths of fans that people didn't have their medals. And I think it means a lot to people that watch the sport. Yes. Uh, especially like medium fans right that not just every four years but they watch the big events and sometimes they watch the bigger events when there are more personalities but you know people did get turned off to this and on the with the retirements and the lack of personalities I think people got disgusted to you know a certain level and it's interesting because covering at the time you know you're looking at the google alerts it really dropped and really the invasion of Ukraine just took up all of the oxygen and- Understandably this, so, I mean, yeah. And this was done and then, right, Russia was of course banned. And once Russia was banned, everyone just dropped it. Like this story, you know, they, they were equated but they were separate events. It, yes, and, and we talked about this a little on the show. It seemed like somehow there was a consequence and there was somehow justice in this. However, it's accidental and actually has nothing to do with it. As we know, only just now did they give us the date for the hearing for Valieva in September. In Russia, great history of chess players, right? They absolutely just sat on that story once they could, right? Yeah. Because I think it's really interesting is that Dr. Shevetsky has actually been essentially promoted and has... Um, a position within Russian figure skating in the Federation right now. And we saw him with Tamara Moskvina last week. Which so. again is something that on the outside, you're like, how absurd. Mm -hmm. But to know every Federation does kind of do that, reward the bad behavior in a way. And, and, and that's unfortunate. But I have to say that I think that US figure skating and their culture from the inside out absolutely dropped the ball. And I think, in my opinion, this is right, in my opinion, they dropped the ball. And it's very interesting to me that they never went after the Russians, really spoke about that strongly. And now they're saying something 500 days later and their response is, um, they're gonna have an exhibit at the Olympic Museum with the nine empty metal boxes. And they have these three athletes on the Today Show saying that they're not going to let this happen to other people, yet they say absolutely nothing about how that is, and there's no substance so far behind that, right? And I found it very interesting that Alexa said that she was shocked that a Russian athlete was doping. Now, I think that you could say that you were shocked that someone would be caught for a test at the Olympic Games, but knowing the culture inside of figure skating, inside pair skating, which is a very small community, um, there are a lot of pair skaters who have trained in Russia in different camps. Nina Mosier, um, there are former Russian skaters who trained in Sochi, um, right, with different, representing different countries. And it's very interesting because hearing that would come back was surprising to me that they, but I, but I think that U.S. figure skating coaches their athletes who rise to the top to stay out of it, right? Yes, I agree 100%. And, you know, I, I often think back to Jeremy Abbott and, and unfortunately getting into hot water over the Sochi and gay rights comment. Mm -hmm. And um, you are suddenly asking people that may not, have earned a seat at the table in certain conversations, their opinions on certain things. And I think when they don't have the nuanced answer, it's just easiest to, to try to stay out of it. It's also clear that, and I noticed this especially, I was intrigued by the Japanese Federation's lack of response because they're obviously a big part of this metal situation as well. And it seems like everyone in an effort to not ruffle feathers has just sort of taken a classy high road and just sort of waited. Um, Couple of things, I, yeah. Where's the outrage? Especially also, for Japan. We also live in this world where, like legally, right? Volieva took one drug that was banned 
but she took three drugs of a certain nature put together, very damning, right? It's a cocktail, right? So yes, the trimetazidine was the one drug of three that was illegal, but do you discount the other two? No, absolutely, you have to look at that and look at the bigger picture. But if you just look at the one thing, you could say, oh, it could be a, a false, you know, test or how did she test positive? No, how do you have three heart drugs in your system together? Because so that's- you're saying the other two of the three were legal, but knowing that they were combined and with the, the trimetazidine, that it sort of creates a very yes. picture of what this was. Yeah. Yes, but you're able to do it. You could say, oh, she was a 15 year old girl. Yes, but she's a part of a system, right? And at what age do they start taking? These are questions that you as figure skating isn't asking. And it's, you know, figure skating is a sausage factory where you don't want to know how it's made, right? In many respects, in terms of coaching. And I think if you listen to Adam and Ashley's podcast, there, you know, there's, and it's always been like that in figures. They've always had the image of the ice princess, but this is the cultural ramifications of that, of staying above the fray, right? Um, you, and people become shocked when they hear different things about this. Yeah. The, the podcast with Ashley and Adam was, both interesting and infuriating in some ways because again it was a TV show for me yeah yeah even while they're saying things like oh you have to really talk you have to really communicate and really do all these things yet even they were sort of backing away from getting too specific well, because they both work as commentators rising right they work for NBC E like that whole umbrella right so if they speak too harshly and U.S. figure skating obviously has partnerships with the broadcasters, could they be out of a job, right? Like they want to do the right thing, but how far can they go? And that's part of this culture. It was the same thing with this. I find it really interesting that when Alexa said that she was really shocked about the doping, because I disagree. Um, I, I think that you could be shocked that someone is caught on such a big stage, but I don't think that I was surprised. I mean, that was such common conversation, especially when Nina Mosier was also brought in to work with U.S. figure skating. And we talked about this last week. Remember, Stobova and Klimov, they went to her maybe nine months be approximately before Sochi, and their improvement was astronomical, right? It was They're inexplicable. It was inexplicable. The way they showed up at, at Sochi was inexplicably excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And Nina Mosier was one of the first coaches, along with the Terry Tuberides, to really work hand in hand with Dr. Shevetsky in terms of individual preparations of athletes. Yeah. And remember, like she was also connected to, there's something with like, the funding and the schools in Russia, but Brobrova was connected through Nina Mosier when she worked with Dr. Shevetsky at the Europeans, where she tested positive for. Uh, Meldonia. Now, Alexa was competing at the world level at the time that someone tested positive for Meldonium for Russia when all of the skaters were taking it before. So that's where I really think it's very interesting. And obviously, and you never know, is this a conversation that NBC wants to have? How far does NBC want to talk about Russian doping when they essentially need Russian participation to have an opponent for the US for the Olympics, which is a giant TV show at the end of the day, as far as they are concerned, right? Do you like, anticipate they're waiting and like during the Paris games or something, they will come out with all of these sorts of things about the, the unfinished business from, from Beijing? I think NBC, this is so interesting because I was interviewed by someone from NBC Nightly News recently, right? They wanted to do a year retrospective and I thought, and they were asking me these questions. And I thought like, this is your news division, right? You have this connection, you should be, I've already done this homework. It was a bunch of younger kids. And they were asking questions. And I thought it's interesting because the article came out and even reading it, it was like, I could have written it to where you want to go far, but not ask, they could, they could have gone further in terms of asking questions. And it mm -hmm. seems like people just say Valjeva's entourage, but they never give any details. When were these people hired? What are the other cases? Who was her doctor? What were these things, right? What has happened to them since? And they don't ask those questions. And I think that that's, you know, a lot of people, 
have gotten angry when we've even covered Russia. But my take has always been, well, you have to keep abreast of what they're doing. You have to watch of how are they treating Valieva? She did that whole program to say that this was all like a Truman Show media conspiracy against her. You have to watch their position. I mean, they haven't stopped, right? Their normal right. uh, modus operandi. So I think it's really interesting. And obviously they have a vested interest in keeping her at the top. But I was curious when the athletes said that they weren't going to allow this to happen to other people. I thought, how? I do think that Vincent- oh, look, we have visitors, Dave. Yes. <laughs> As we're talking about Russian doping. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, What's interesting is I, I'm curious if this all falls under the, the umbrella of mm -hmm. trying to be gracious and not ruffle feathers. So even when like Vincent, for instance, was saying that on the Today Show, I think it's almost a justification to be like, I'm not on this, this show because I'm angry. I don't have a medal. I want to prove it's also about the bigger good. And in the same way, like Alexa or mentioned something, I think right before they went on, they were like, we're aware of what this means compared to the bigger life events happening in the world right now. And there's a lot of, you know, sort of underplaying it because they want to make sure it appears they have that perspective, but it's still a big deal. It's not to say other big, important things are happening in the world, but this is also a big deal. You're allowed to want your medal. You're allowed to- very strategic from all sides, right? It's, and to me, what I got from this is that NBC could potentially give them a medal ceremony to then promote the next Olympics. It could right. be a big, oh, happy ending, they get it. Maybe they, Oprah gives them all a trip somewhere, right? A vacation and boom, right? Like to make it up to these athletes. like that they would have some sort of big ceremony on the plaza, which I imagine they will do. I think I said that on future show, I don't past previous shows. Um, and we'll tie this in and it will be a big happy ending instead of asking the really tough questions. Because I think if NBC went too tough against the Russians, are you then damaging your own Olympic brand? Because if you tell people that the Olympics are dirty, how are you then going to turn around and ask them to watch? Yeah. The average person that's not. Or even their relationship with the IOC. Yes. You know, because I, I, again, going back to the Adam and Ashley podcast, they were like, a lot of the people you would have to talk to or bring things up to will view you as a troublemaker. You will not be viewed as someone who needs help. You will be viewed as someone creating a, a drama. Uh, yeah. But the drama is already there. Yeah. And it, it's just absurd. And again, I think watching the Japanese Federation in particular just take a total back seat and not really make any comments tells me what a complex web this must be and who's afraid of overstepping and who's afraid of offending and, and, and all this sort of stuff. But I just think about the importance of that team medal in Japan. This was a huge thing for them. Um, and you want to see them rewarded with a medal, whether that's a bronze, whether that's a silver, I don't know, but they have basically said nothing as far as I can tell. But the, yeah, I mean, I think Japan hasn't, but it seems like everyone is waiting and fearful of Russia's return, right? Because politically, there absolutely could be ramifications if you Russia covers every single quote that every single athlete gives. There's an article about what Vincent said, what everyone said, right? That's covered in their press. They're taking notes, right? About what everyone said. And there is a belief that they will be back sooner than later, right? I mean, it's always, although, but things are changing. We're seeing in the war over the weekend, like stuff is happening in Russia. If Putin were to be out, would Thomas Bach be out of the IOC? Right, there are all of these things that are, could change very quickly and impact the Olympics more so than I think people realize. Um, and it'll really be fascinating to see what happens. I mean, if Putin were out, right? Think about where Atari's athletes make money from. Cause you mm -hmm. wanna say that the athletes are innocent, right? 
But those skating shows all get money from Putin, who is particularly vested in sports, right? He was a fencer. He uses it as sports propaganda. Well, if Putin were to be out and this new person, who knows if he likes sports, but let's say that he doesn't and he's no longer going to be state funding um, the, the shows of Averbuk, Navka, right? Plushenka. Where are those skaters going to make that money from, right? Things could be very different in Russian athletics as soon as that changes, right? I mean, quite frankly, the same thing happens in classical music and in opera. He, he has single-handedly seen to the success of many, many important Russian singers as well. I mean, and it was interesting because, again, the way we perceive... Uh, Russia's uh, overall public approach to skating seems very positive, very invested, all of this sort of stuff. And then I remember being rather floored by one of the, the heads up at some point saying, why are we even paying for these shows? And then mm. there were some sort of like cryptic homophobic remarks in there. Yeah. And, and Tatiana Tarasova came out and was like, if you don't understand the importance of sport, like da 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 da. Um, but suddenly it was clear to me that maybe not everyone is on board with bankrolling all of these sorts of, mm -hmm. of sports and shows they, like that. And they have, they've had too many and they haven't had the oxygen put in from winning, right? So they haven't covered the sports as much because the war gets so much coverage in Russia. If you talk to journalists and some of the people there that the recent season of Ice Age there and the recent competitions aren't getting the same ratings. The people aren't buying that the Russian domestic nationals, they don't mean as much as when they beat foreign competitors. And that, right? that just tells you what might motivate their public viewing. I mean, yes. But that I'll motivates NBC's viewing. Right, yeah. we happen to like the sport, we do, right? But by and large, it is absolutely about the US going against Russia, US going against China. It's just veiled, right? Yeah, I thought it was interesting because in, in my circles, when NBC was sort of like, I think doing the work for the layman when they were first showing the team event in Beijing, they were sort of endearing Valieva to the US public because they knew we were out of it. Well, so, they're creating characters, right, to follow. Yeah, and so yes. now all the Americans were, in fact, very entranced by Valieva, rooting for Valieva, because, but again, I think it comes down to the skating, and, and this sort of circles back to what we were talking about with, like, Ilya and all this sort of stuff. You can talk about these big ultra-C elements, but when the general public is viewing, they don't get the ultra-C element. They just want to see something lovely, and right now the climate especially in Beijing, was that there wasn't always lovely programs and lovely skating happening. And that's, to me, easy for, for a casual viewer to get up and walk out. Mm -hmm. I so. thought it was really interesting being in Beijing for the summer games and actually being in the press room. I remember Christine Brennan going up to Steve Penny and the woman was Leslie something. I remember what she looks like, brown hair, uh, who was like the press person for you. And it was like in the basement of the arena, right? And they were not going that hard against the Chinese being underage, though they felt that they were, right? And that there had been evidence at the time. And it that also seems strategic. Like, oh, wait mm -hmm. a second, they're not going. And then you think of the bigger issues of the money that they're getting from NBC, perhaps you don't want to say everyone is cheating, right? To that, because then how do you? But do, my other question to that is, and again, I, I just keep bringing it back to opera because this happens all the time that the people covering it are not the experts. So I remember even when we would dial into those like press conferences yes. or whatever, and you clearly get reporters that know nothing that were just sent to get some quotes and create some sort of fluff story. But when you don't have someone who knows the history, knows the scuttlebutt on like all of this sort of stuff, it, it, everything just becomes sort of vague. Even like you were saying with your, you know, year and wrap up interview with the NBC no. people, there's always this question where you wonder if they really know what they're talking about, if they were handed a series of questions that they're now asking, but they don't know enough about the subject matter to really dive any deeper. Well, this also, it goes back to the athletes. When the athletes are taught not to question and to stay out and not to give comments, 
this is how something like this happens, right? Because if athletes had spoken up about everything that they knew about doping along the way, and if the Federation had actually been stronger, they wouldn't be in this position, right? But because everyone has sat out for so long, this happens, right? If they believed that that commentary would lead to something, if you- Wait a second. These are the first athletes who are going to fight anyone who gets criticism, right? But how much has U.S. figure skating said about doping? Now, they could all say that Phil Hirsch is the mean one, right? They can all say that we're the mean one, that Christine is. But look, U.S. figure skating isn't doing anything but putting open metal boxes out, which basically makes everyone say, oh, these poor athletes. But at the same, look at, we are- No the action. Big- yeah, yeah. But that same no action is what they did about- John Coughlin, in my opinion, right? When they uh, when that when they, they had the opportunity to investigate and they wanted the governing body that doesn't publish their findings uh, to investigate. You know, these these are cultural issues that happen, and this is something that happens as a result. So I think it's really interesting that yeah, it could absolutely keep happening. Because if they're not going to go up against Russia and demand reforms, nothing is ever going to change, even when they come back in. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, I remember when they were first talking about this during the breakup of the Soviet Union is they're everywhere. The people mm-hmm. that were that grew up under a certain federation and a certain system now represent mm-hmm. I don't know what the percentage would be like a whole third of of the international market for judges and referees and specialists and all this sort of stuff. Um, even as we were talking about Jonathan Guerrero's because mom. The Germans right? used to actually be as strong as the Soviets or that alliance, but East Germany, Austria, like these were countries that someone like Linda Frediani had to watch out for. Correct. For Correct. Between yeah. Dagmar and Annette. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, and to your point about who has the guts to say it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and it took me a while when I was young to get into Dick Button's commentary, but now, of course, as an adult, I'm completely obsessed. But he, I remember at the time him saying, like, look at those flags. They might as well be four Soviet Union flags on this panel. And we're going to be surprised that they've all put this sort of mediocre Russian skater ahead of someone more talented. He's like, look at that. That's very clear what's happening. And I find in today's sort of coverage and, and society around it, Johnny and Tara would never say something like that. Oh, well, look. About, and th- you talk about the mediocre skaters. How many mediocre German skaters were elevated in the results based on the fact that uh, they had judges on the panel and figures, right, which maybe right. they were or weren't good at, to the point that you started to believe that these skaters were better than they were because of reputation, right? Right. Soon you look at, after 1988, how come there were not so many good German skaters after like the funding fell out and the political pull fell out and it happened very quickly that yeah. those skaters really started to dissipate. I mean, yeah. you don't we don't think about like the beautiful German Brooke Shields look like competing in figure skating today. I mean, no offense to Nicole Schott, but she is not of the same stature that they used to be, yeah, and there's certainly even with the volume. From Gabby to Annette to Jan to Katarina, you know, I, I mean, and even the the success of Germans sort of right after that fall, um, you still sort of a reunification. Sorry, uh, the they were still a part of that initial system. Yeah. Also, the Ingo Steuers, and was it Marlene? Kleiman? Who was who yeah, was and they the, also they had a the bronze medalist in pairs that got the bronze over Kenny and Jojo when you watch those performances back to back. You're like, really? Yeah. Really? Justice yeah. for Jojo. Okay. Justice so, for Kenny, fourth place in two different Kenny. Place the Olympics. I know Kenny is wonderful. But if you and but if you meet Jojo, she's like Sunshine. Sunshine. This yeah. guy, Michael Steer, wrote this unauthorized book about Scott Hamilton. It was originally supposed to be authorized. And one of the TSL Live viewers, um, who's amazing, she writes for the Boston Globe. Her name is Kat Cornetta. And she's like, you have to read this. So I found a copy from Used and New on um, Amazon. This man calls out every single person in figure skating for being phony, um, f- right? The, all of their attitudes. He's obsessed with Jojo Starbuck when he meets her. There's like an entire chapter about how she is like Glinda the Good Witch in a- She is, she is. Every every skating event, 
She didn't know who the hell I am. And I would just go up and say, oh, hi, you know, da, 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 da. always lovely, always with a smile, always with a kind word, always with time for everyone, just a real class act. Cool. Yeah. Incredible. But even, you know, even Christine's book, mm -hmm. uh, plural, I mean, they full blown banned her from even being able to go for that period of time. They are so afraid of, of the image being anything but fluffy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, I mean, it makes total sense to me that that's how the athletes present themselves. And we have seen time and time again. Well, athletes, but this figure skating is in dirty too. They still were hiring Nina Mosier to work right. with the peers during all of this time. And, you and when you invite Nina without Dr. Shevetsky, you see the results are rather limited. Yes. Well, yeah. speaking of that, how the Georgian, like, can we just cut the, on that? Jonathan, you talk about how Stobova uh, just improved astronomically. How about the Georgian pair that fell apart this season? Do you think it's possible that maybe Georgia decided to, or Terry decided to bankroll cooperation with Dr. Shevetsky for the Olympic season? How come Morris and the Georgian pair improved so rapidly? during the Olympic season and then the season after how did the Georgian pair and Morris perform right and well, frankly before yeah 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 the, the Georgian pair in particular was mm. always a very tough watch for me and I we all look at this sort of stuff through our own lens and mm. so I base this nothing other than what my gut was telling me every time I saw them was someone needs to save this girl. Yeah. Uh, everything about it. I saw, in my opinion, and in just in my own take on it, I saw trauma on mm. the ice. And even when this article comes out where he's like, no, 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 you know, we should still be nice to her even though she gained weight and messed it up and all this sort of stuff. It's horrifying to me. And, and of course it alludes to just a bigger culture issue um, about the way, women in Paris skating are treated. Well, how about the weight issue, right? <laughs> if you remember how many times have you been asked the pointed question, do you think a drug can make someone skate as beautifully as Camila Valieva? That is one of their favorite arguments, but you're like, well, it made <laughs> Marisi win medals at Skate Canada, or at least perform well in the free program in a way that you had never seen before or since, right? And then as soon as the Olympic season is over, they break. They break. Yeah. They break. Look at all of the athletes, how they performed during Sochi, after Sochi, right? I mean, incredible. The Even for Kamishiba after 2015, and then had to sort of yes. re recalibrate and come back up. Yes. It, it, it's just... It's very... My heart always broke for her. Why, why can't he just get stronger? Yeah. But I, I don't understand the concept here. And, and the fact that she was so injured tells me uh, how wackadoodle her body must have been feeling and, and the trauma and journey it was going through during all of that. It was devastating to watch them. And, and you felt they were pinning it on her. I hate it. pinning it on her. But that's another reason where last week I spoke out that I didn't agree with the pairing of a 12 year old with a 20 year old. And I got a text from her coach saying, but this is for the survival of pairs. And this is to, you know, what if he wouldn't be able to have a partner if not? And I replied back to that coach and I said, you know, I think that the other issues potentially outweigh it. And I'm not saying that everyone is bad. This could be the most wonderful 20 year old boy, you know, the most protective, but there is still the issue of normalizing a 12 year old and a 20 year old together. There is also um, the liability of like, what if you're in a competition and this person is drinking with older people and the younger person is in the room, right? What's the open for liability there? What if the 20 year old has an injured shoulder and wants to say to the girl, you know, you really should lose some weight, right? Or what if the power well, dynamic, what if it's not the most wonderful, right? There are all of these potential issues across the board that I think outweigh it. So my response to this is twofold, mm -hmm. like my chin. I, I think on the one yeah. point of the, <laughs> that was just a joke I always use, um, the, the point of keeping pairs alive. Okay, if that, is your, if that is your goal, 
Mm -hmm. This may not be the solution. So, so the bigger conversation and the more interesting conversation is what can we do for mm -hmm. this older guy in order to do it? How can we moving forward create a different system? Well, in he could skate with Alexa and learn pair skills. She's pretty freaking talented at the moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other one, again, circling back to the Ashley and Adam podcast, when they were talking about the, the difficulty in the junior levels is they were talking about you cannot have a 20 something year old socializing with a preteen nonstop, traveling yeah. together, doing the whole thing. And only in skating would that seem just the way it goes. I want to put one thing out. I just said something and I don't know if everyone here that watches is going to understand people often take lessons with an experienced coach for partnering. So ice dancers will like, Igor Lukanen will skate with the adult bronze lady who wants to learn a dance, right? Uh, Evgeny Krasnopolsky works on death spirals with a woman who wants to learn them. Right? This is just like something that happens. I just wanted to put that out there because people are gonna be like, how dare you? I just want to explain that this is a practice and how yeah. coaches make money, so. Yeah, by doing, doing those sorts of things, but actually teaming up as a full-time team Chris, can you always, listen, when Megan Messenberg was learning pairs, she did lifts and twists with Chris. Like, this is how people make money. I just wanted to put that out there to explain. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because so, that it was used about the boy learning pairs, right? Also, and Jonathan, how many successful pairs do you know that turn to pairs at 12? In the U.S., they learn the jump technique first and then move to pairs. Now, you could say that we're changing the dynamic, but I don't think that a 12-year-old and a 20-year-old works together because as soon as the 20-year-old finds a partner that they can compete with internationally and the 12-year-old doesn't have a partner, is the 12-year-old going to left, like being left feeling high and dry, feeling like they were used potentially, even if it was explained to them in advance? So yeah. that's just like a potential issue, right? And then you have... A situation, you know, because in theory, you have the 12 year old and the 20 year old together, they learn pairs, they both find suitable partners, and you go from having one pair to two pairs, which is better for you as coaches, it's double the money, and double the chances for success. Unless something bad happens between the pair, right? And then you have no pair left. And then you have maybe fewer skaters that want to come to you because there's an issue. This is just like the different thing. It's a, I wouldn't want to coach pairs. I think it's a nightmare. I, I see dance teams when they split up or the issues about how many, it's a lot of negotiations, having two sets of parents to deal with per lesson than one. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, yeah. A lot of problems. So complicated. And uh, you know, that coach is probably um, correctly concerned about how do you keep pairs moving forward? Mm -hmm. I just don't know that, that this is it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so broaden, broad, zoom out and find a, a real solution because if this is the solution, it doesn't seem sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I also, um, there was an interview with Barbara Fusarpoli this week and I was dying for your take on this. I love she was, her. <laughs> she was talking to Dario Cirzano about how she actually put him together with one of her skaters. And then they asked if they could go and train in Montreal for a while. And she was really honest about her feelings of like basically the eye roll against Montreal and how successful and how many teams, how successful they are, how many teams. But she didn't they claim it was unjust. She just knew that it was such this powerhouse and they had so many resources and so many teams and so many people working. She did say so many judges. She said that, rather. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And this same week that this interview came out, Montreal announced that they have a Swiss team. And this is where, you know, they're, they treat their athletes really well, right? And we've always really liked Montreal and it is yeah. a brand. They are doing something very cool and special there that's different. Right. But I do think their own promotion and remember that one of their coaches is married to an agent right that has helped brand them and make them so successful right and they've done so great things for skaters and you know treating them well I do find it uncomfortable that they announce what country they now have and how many teams they have all because it's almost advertising how powerful they are politically 
potentially on a panel, right? Where they are, oh, now we have, <laughs> basically I thought, oh, now you have the Swiss judge. I don't remember the skaters' names, but I remember that they have a Swiss judge. Mm. And then is it better to be the 20th ranked team in Montreal and the 20th priority? Or is it better to not have that pull behind you and have a coach that has fewer teams and has more energy and attention to give you? What is going to get you to the rhythm? What's going to get you to the free dance? The politics or the yeah. attention? Yeah. I mean, to me, I would 100% want to go to the small pond. Yeah. I want more of what could be drawn out of me. I believe 100% in what Montreal is doing and delivering for their teams, especially that they seem to all improve in their skating skills. They have unique material every year. Um, and yes, you're probably going to get the benefit of the doubt and get a little bit of a, a political push. Um, however, even though we may find the, the current Italian team less thrilling, I don't mm. know that that's due to a limitation of Barbara or perhaps just a limitation of that particular team. I think she has some great energy something really interesting to say. She seems to be a master technician in getting all these points and stuff. I would want more of the one-on-one -on -one time. I would want to be more special to my coach personally. Are you curious? I don't think it's ever really been laid out. And I think it's a fair question, but something that would never be discussed. What is the benefit financially that they get off of having the lower ranked teams with Scott? Does he have to pay them a, a franchise like fee for the name, right? Or is it all about the judges in that school? But yes, they are spreading um, they are spreading their philosophy of ice dance and making the world better for everyone. Yes. But are they getting a cut? Do they get $5 a lesson? Do they get like, what is the actual- Knowing financial? that they're, they're really the source of, of who's interested in coming. Yeah. Right. No, is that a brand deal? Know. Is that like a percentage? Is it just about the judges that we're collecting? Like, how does that work? Yeah. And what happens when Panamarenko, what happens if Panamarenko is, oh, Hawaii and Baker had time off. Let's say they come back to competition this season. They've been training. What happens when if Panamarenko were to supplant them? Mm. Like consistently beat them at two Grand Prix. Well, and even as we were hearing sometimes in like in the late 70s and 80s, people came forward and they were like, okay, we'll push this one of your skaters, but at the cost of the other. Yeah. Uh, so that would always concern me. Also, if I was in such a big camp, are they going to pull out their cards for some other teams? And then I'm going to just be the sacrificial lamb in the place. <laughs> Yeah, and it always made sense, right? Like, I think it, it's fine as long as everything stays the same. And this is what happens with all ice dance camps. But when teams start to get out of order is when there are hard feelings and people leave it and people split, it, and, right? And now you have a perfect situation where Hawaii and Baker were out because of injuries and issues that happened, right? And now maybe this is going to be their last season. We don't know. They haven't said, but you're out, you've lost that political pull. So you're starting over. And if judges want to put someone else ahead, they now have an excuse to, right? Where do they fit? Are they still ahead of Lila and Lewis? Are they still ahead of the Cana Danes? You know, right? Well, what happens between the two schools if a Scott team were to actually beat a team, right? Is there a From problem? Headquarters, yeah. From headquarters, does this team get to switch and go to headquarters if they want? Like, what is the actual thing and what happens there? And it's something that no one would ever want to talk about, but it's a very, that would be the kind of thing that could cause a splintering eventually. I right? mean, I, even, you know, and I don't want to think it's still as political as it is, but of course I know that it is, especially in dance. Um, I, I always think back to when Buchan was skating some of his finest. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stepanova and Buchan, <laughs> never best me on about, um, Stepanova and Buchan. And We're back with Julian, yes. Mm -hmm. And then there's Vicky and Nikki. And at some point they were almost a bit more even in their position internationally. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like the Russians couldn't decide which one to go all in for. So they were kind of flip-flopping back and forth and they were kind of, no one was emerging on top because they were both sort of middling. And then it seemed like collectively Russia just decided 
to sacrifice the political pull for Stepanova and Bukin and give it all to Vicky and Nikki. So you saw them surge forward while then Bukin and Stepanova just sort of crashed down in the rating or the ratings, the rankings. Yeah. Well, it happened at Worlds this year. The caller was considered a Montreal judge. He's always been considered that since the, right? I don't know that Barbara has much of a chance, uh, right? And here's the thing, we are all human. If, if I'm adjudicating yeah. a vocal competition and there are two evenly matched singers and I happen to know and like one of them, mm -hmm. it's not to say they got something they didn't deserve, but it can often also be a tiebreaker in some opinions. When you feel like you've got two evenly matched people, it's easy, it's just human nature to go with the one you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, I don't, I, and it was interesting, you were sending me some articles. I don't envy the task of a lot of these judges who are volunteering their time, who mm -hmm. everyone is angry with all the time, who have yeah. so many things to answer to, so many other people pressuring them, you know, and yet I, I would imagine it's an outrageously stressful experience. I think easy to hate them, um, but I think being in their position, it must be outrageously complicated. Yeah, I think it's really complicated. Um, also coming up with material, right? For 30 teams, how do you keep having ideas? Now, I think what's great about Montreal is that Roman does some of the choreography, Marie France does, they collaborate. Maybe they'll bring other people in. I mean, that's Sam Schwinard uh, does choreography, Madison Hubble choreographs. So I think that we're starting to see it being more collaborative because- it's best thing I can say about them. Because again, the problem, like with some of the Sambo 70s stuff was the formulaic quality that was coming out. And they have, I mean- But yes, remember the early season, remember the season when Olivia Smart and Adrian Diaz did the program about like a woman and a man, and they like put two pieces of music together. People were starting to get sick of the Montreal aesthetic. That because season. it became a Papadakis Cicerone knockoff program for yes. people. But also they have grown. I, 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 as a coaching yes. team, you see them creating more individual sort of moments for everyone now. And I think sometimes if you get the generic program, it might be because yeah. that's what they're dealing now, with. Now it's like you have the Danny G programs in Korea, you have the Unikim tributes, and then we... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Japan, all, as always, one of my favorites, offering the most variety in yeah. all of their skaters. Consistently awesome skating skills, um, yeah. but but each each one it seems, and they, they are less all in a camp. Mm -hmm. uh, and everyone seems to be doing their own thing a little bit more so than other countries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, there was, <laughs> it's broken on Twitter, but you know, Madison Chalk has a um, a Spotify that is public that you can see what she's following and people have figured out what she's skating to from season to season, whether it's intentional or not, but she will lit like the music. Oh, listen, oh my like, goodness, how funny she, is that? Okay. So it appears that they're doing a Pink Floyd free dance this season, right? And of course, people were thinking about Virtue and Moyer, which happened in 2009. So I think it's free reign and they only competed at free dance like three times. So I think it's fair game, right? And right, right yeah. But how funny that, that like these detectives are on the case. The detectives <laughs> knew what they were skating to last season. They figured it out, the David Bowie. So yeah, just, and we do know that Lila and Lewis are doing Sweet Dreams. Uh, which uh, Ashley Wagner did, which That's I think right. will work for them. I think um, so, I think so too. That'll be good. It's not the most unexpected choice for them, but I think it will be- but it'll work. It'll, it'll work. work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, also uh, there was a skater that had, oh, also a Terry in Georgia. You know how the, the Chait family like runs the Israeli Federation, Igor Lukan and like, is in charge of Azerbaijan. Is Terry gonna run Georgia pretty soon? Because now you have, Terry has the pairs, she has their dance team. And are we gonna see her supply the single skaters that they need for a team? Because mm -hmm. Kubanka had been an Terry skater, is that correct? Yeah. Or did I make it up? I'm sorry? Kubanka? I don't think so. Not ever? I don't think so, but now I'm- It's very possible. I, I, I totally- Can I tell you something? 
because of the dissolution of Russia, Kubanova has absolutely gotten more attention and notoriety than she ever would have, like... Although, remember, you know who her biggest fan is? Is Paulina Edmonds. I don't want to argue with Paulina about this. anything. She's Some a really operation. strong point of view. Um, but she, although Paulina was is working a double axle Euler triple sal triple loop. That's like her goal right now on Instagram. Paulina has quite the fascinating answer. I'm team Paulina, right? Yeah, she was always her, interesting, yeah. Paulina's birthday party every year that she throws for herself reminds me of like the Taylor Swift 4th of July party. Like I'm equally as fascinated by what's going on with Paulina and what's going on with Taylor. And I believe they're about as friendly and that they're about as competitive, right? Like they are. <laughs> Uh, listen, I'm team Paulina. I'm just telling you. Uh, just, <laughs> I don't know. I'm still team Paulina Tsurtskaya. I missed her there. Wait, 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 wait. No, I was right. Her, she is not listed as a former Atari okay. dater. Okay. Former coaches, Buyanova, Ormanov, Turenko, Usatov. She's with Evgeny or Rukovic. No. Okay. I was right. I was right. I know my team too breeds the skaters. Believe you. Oh. Yeah, and I yeah. Okay. No. Okay. She is no. <laughs> Maybe a terrible franchise team to Baridza. Maybe they could have locations around the globe. They could spread their wonderful view of skating to everyone. With their Ooh. unique program approach. Ridiculous yeah. world. Right. This is um yeah. The uh, by the way, the other ice dancers totally talk crap about Montreal all the time. So it's great that- Because they feel like they have a stranglehold on the scene. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. And, 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 and they feel standards. like it's culty, right? They feel like because they all speak that they're all, everyone speaks that they're so happy, but come on. You yeah. know, if someone beats someone and they think that that's unfair. But at least the work is also good. Yes, And that, to me, is the difference between that and Sambo 70. You can say, well, Sambo 70 has all the awards and the accolades and the medals, but mm -hmm. at the core of it, I don't care for, for the formula they're pushing. At least in Montreal, I do. I do as well. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed a rib and ice dancer here and there. They know what's... Right. Yes. <laughs> Ridiculous. Okay. Yes, correct. <laughs> but I don't think it's, it behooves the sport to sort of go to centralized camps for everything because then you lose people like, I, I have always said, I thought Krilova and obviously that, that dance team of hers is amazing. Barbara, these people, it's easy for them to get lost in the mix, but it's important to have those alternate perspectives on the ice. It's important. It's always been this way. Yeah. How about when you could go to Carlo? Mm, yeah. Expertise in the Olympic year. Yeah. Carlo, who married his student. Carlo, who was the figures master and um, the politician du jour. Yes. So a great. Linda. It's Linda. always been that way, though, you think about yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah. I, mm -hmm. Also, there was a, um, a music video by. Alexandra Trusova that came out this week. She's uh, the song is Two Wings. Jonathan, we could be judgy about it if we want. I believe she sings approximately about as much as Kylie Minogue does on her current hit single. So I, 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 I mean, I don't know why people are hating on Trusova. Okay, I, I mean, I don't think it takes a lot of um, vocal talent to be a pop star. Yeah, you know, it's, and it's not to say certain pop stars don't have the vocal talent. But some of the way the songs are written don't require it. Yeah. Listen, I want to see a song with her about overcoming obstacles. And I would like to watch her as she like pushed to Terry and, you know, giving that interview. Like this is the kind of person that has the personality. Music can be so cathartic. Let out those feelings through song, honey. Yeah. Yeah. A love letter to Mark, question mark. <laughs> Uh, or my explosion at the Olympics, yeah. Passion, we could call rage it. Rage-filled techno song or something. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I think that I'm for, it's kind of a catchy bop in a way. Now the video and the wardrobe, the skirt was made out of belts. I was confused, right? I was like, are those belts? Like a, 
a denim tuxedo that exploded. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, her outfit kind of looked like one of the challenges on Drag Race. When one of the I was just thinking that with the white boots and the, yeah. Listen, when they get out the glue gun and they're starting to put it together. like With five minutes left, yeah. You know, that I like that Trusev is really leading into like the Russian red. Yes. Like, where, where is that hue that Marina Anisina and every ice dancer get? Like, we don't see that outside of Moscow. They don't have it on the shelves in North America, I don't think. You got a special that is, one. That is special to Russia, but I, she's leaning in, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I'm for it. She's a yeah. journalist. She's a pop singer. She's, you know, listen. Ella is an economist, right? So yeah. who knows what is happening? <laughs> well, apparently Zagitov is opening up her own skating school. Terrific. Terrific, right? Yes. Two twos for everyone. I think she'll be wildly successful. Okay, she seems like the most genius coach, right? This is, what could go wrong, right? Yeah, it's fascinating to see them all just like ping-ponging around trying to find it. You yeah. know, I think Sagitova was really led by some really um, wonderful down-to-earth coaches, and if she emulates them, it's, and one would think, especially in that environment, and now at such a young age, sometimes that's all you would know how to do is recreate what you experienced. Yeah, could you imagine? Could you imagine? No. Tricky, tricky. Perpetuating a cycle. I, yes. <laughs> But I think I see that in the U.S. too, like we see athletes that go right from competing to coaching. And I feel like there needs to be a break, right? Yeah. Some time for perspective, because also, as we know, it's always going to be through your own lens. Mm -hmm. But if you are still so close to your own competing, I think it's hard to, and we've noticed this with choreographers, of course, too. When are you choreogra choreographing for yourself or when are you coaching yourself? but it happens to be someone else. And how do you learn how to sort of observe what's in front of you and what they need, not what you would have been given in that same scenario? They do evolve. I mean, remember when Raheem first started becoming really popular and all of his step sequences had those like big kicks and moments where like, but Mariah Bell's not Jason. Yeah. But then now he's completely, you know, It just takes time. Yeah, of course. And Jeremy, when he, I think he did a program for, Ashley Kane, and it looked like Jeremy could have skated it, but then now you see he's evolved. So yeah, yeah. And, and some of those things, no matter how talented you are or how hard you work, mm -hmm. some things just inevitably take time. And that's what, of course, when Plushenko first came on the scene and everyone was like, well, let's see what he's got. And it's like, will you give him a sec? We don't know what he's got yet. He doesn't know what he's got yet. He has to figure it out first. Yes, we met Frank Carroll with Linda Fradiani, but there were several, test runs before that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm. yeah, I want to see the early Frank skaters. Were they yeah. just very buttoned up and fantastic? Still in the white tuxedo jacket. Yeah, I will say, one of the Frank Carroll skaters that we never talk about is now one of my favorites. Fuyo Igarashi, he had a Japanese male skater that was so artistic. Of course, he wore all black, like a Frank Carroll skater. But if you look him up at like 1979 NHK or the early 80s, I mean, this was a fantastic skater. And it's never, you know, never discussed in the pantheon of Frank Carroll skaters. Say the name again. I have to be honest. Like, it's you know, like women in the top of that. Say yeah. it one more time. Fumio Igarashi. And he skated okay. and he ended in a split. And he was fantastic. Like, I will forgive him for Evan Lysacek's arms and legs being allowed to have a moment and winning with the points when he gave us Fumio. That was spectacular. Oh, interesting. I'll go check him out. Yeah. So, yeah, he, but Frank does love a man in black. Fumio, Christopher Bowman, uh, Evan Lysacek. Yeah. Slimming, you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, yeah, so I mean, really an, an interesting week in skating. I'm excited that we're about to get some of the new programs uh, in Japan. That's and, always a fun time, yeah. And also this Yuzuru Hanyu show on Disney Plus. Like, I, I am ready. I am ready to just take it in, okay? This is- Mid-July, right? 
Yeah, and then we have the Rory Flack reality series coming on about putting synchro skaters together. So, um... I believe we'll deliver. I think Rory is the kind that will deliver in a reality television type setting. Yeah. And also we wanted to say that Charlie Sear passed away, who is a USFS Olympic judge and who's really beloved by so many skaters and just a really nice guy. So, and he, he um, had a really sudden quick illness. So everyone's super sad about that. So just, you know, our hearts go out to everyone there. So, well, we want to wish you a happy pride and a good summer. Hold an edge and look sexy, everyone. Bye now.